Amen. Awesome. Awesome. <clears throat> the Lord is doing good things all over the world. All over the world. And it's important for us to remember that, that God is doing great things everywhere, not just in our own little, our own little circle. Um, and uh, it's important for us to be part of the body of Christ. And that means that, you know, we're connected to other congregations and, and other peoples who are in Jesus, uh, not only across our city, but across Australia and across the world. Because it's when we can take that real bird's eye view of the kingdom, we can see God's hand at work more thoroughly and, and more fully seeing all the different pieces that God is is putting together and the, and the way he's moving across the body. And sometimes we can miss that when we get myopic and we just become a, about our own little social circle and we come, become about just our own little church here. And, um, but God is doing amazing things all over the place. And um, so I trust you've gotten to Galatians 4. Um, where, we off, where we left off last week, <clears throat> um, we, we were talking about how Paul has this paradigm and this understanding about the world. That in Christ there is this new creation, and in this new creation revelation, this revelation of, of this newness of life, this new creation that's happening in Jesus, the old way doesn't make sense anymore. It doesn't make sense anymore for, for, for the Jewish uh, culture and the Jewish faith to be the exclusive domain of the people of God, but that God is the God of all people, in fact, and that He is embracing all people in the new covenant, and that in Jesus... Our distinctives are not being erased, but the, the dividing walls that we have set up between ourselves are being torn down so that in Jesus the two are being made one, that we are united together with Jewish brothers and sisters. We are united together with Gentile brothers and sisters in Christ in this new creation. And we were reading uh, through Galatians chapter 3, and, and Paul finishes this chapter. Now, keep in mind, um, I feel like I need to mention this, uh, keep in mind that when Paul was writing, he wasn't writing writing in chapter and verse, all right? He's writing a letter. We divide it up later to make it easier to reference, right? But Paul finishes chapter 3, um, at least in our minds. He finishes chapter 3 with this, uh, this line that says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. Now, taking that, he's going to jump into a new uh, analogy that he is going to give us to give the Galatian hearers to, to, to try and shape their understanding of what's going on uh, between uh, the, their relationship to the law and the old way of things and how they are to live uh, right now. So we're going to read uh, Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to read one, uh, verse 1 to verse 20, <clears throat> and we're going to cover some of the broad strokes that are happening here. So it says this, Paul, he says to the Galatians, Now I say that as long as an heir is a child, he differs in no way from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, instead he is under guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were in slavery under the elements of the world. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. But in the past, since you didn't know God, you were enslaved to things that by nature are not God's. But now, since you know God, or rather you have become known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elements? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? You're observing special days, months, seasons, and years, and I am fearful for you that perhaps my labor for you has been wasted. I beg you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I also became like you. You have not wronged me. You know that previously I preached the gospel to you because of a weakness of the flesh. You did not despise or reject me, though my physical condition was a trial for you. On the contrary, you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing? For I testify to you that it if possible, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me, so that I have become. So then, have I become your enemy because I told you the truth? They court you eagerly, but not for good. They want to exclude you from me, so that you they so that you would pursue them. It is always good to be pursued, but in a good manner. And children, I am again suffering labor pains for you until Christ is formed in you. And I would like to be with you right now. 
and change my tone of voice because I don't know what to do about you. Paul, we've got to remember, Paul is trying to wrestle the minds of the Galatians free from the arguments of the Judaizers and the control that the Judaizers have been having over their faith in the way of practice. <clears throat> and here he's going to strengthen his argument. He's going to begin strengthening his argument that he made earlier, that the works of the law, his argument that he made earlier is that the works of the law, that becoming culturally Jewish by observing Torah was never the way to actually be right with God. That, that, was, that, that was actually never the way in which we actually came into right relationship with God. That because Abraham is our, our, our father, it was always based on the promise and it was always based on faith rather than works of the law. It wasn't about outward observance. It was about this thing in the heart that believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so this is, um, <clears throat> so Paul is continuing this argument um, by calling those practices, by calling those practices, whether it's the Galatians coming out of uh, paganism, uh, where they would worship at temples and idols and all, all these sorts of practices and these sorts of things, or the Jewish observance of Torah as being like the way in which we understand ourselves to be right with God. He's going to call those things, those practices rudimentary. He's going to call them weak and worthless. They belong to a time when you did not know better and your knowledge was not full. Now, I know that that is controversial when we're talking about the law of God, that we're talking about the Torah, because, you know, it is God's law. The, the Scripture talks about it being God's law, talks about it being God's word, talks about the Scriptures being important and being, being this revelation from God. But Paul wants us to speak now of these things, of these external practices as being merely things that trained us, uh, custodians and guardians, and that they were never meant to be permanent, but they were meant to be helpers of us to shepherd us into maturity, and that there would be a time when we would no longer need those external boundaries, those external things in order for us to live free, in order for us to live as God would have us live. So <clears throat> an analogy that comes to mind is um, when my kids were in prep, when my kids were in prep, uh, they, they begin learning how to read. Now, if you just throw you know, a novel at a, at a kid who's in prep, they're not going to be able to read it. They're not going to be able to understand it. Right? There's not only going to be a lot of words that are outside their vocabulary, there's going to be a lot of words that they might only understand from inference and, and the understanding, the context of what's being said around it. It's too complex. It's too high level for them. So what they do in prep is they, at least at the school that our kids are at, is they begin by giving them little flashcards. And what they do is each flashcard, they've broken down the English language into all the various sounds that you make in the English language. Ooh. K. Mmm. All these sorts of things. And they've taken all those sounds and they've given a little emoji picture for each of the sounds. Right? And you teach them. You have this little repetitious thing that you teach them. It's like you, you get a picture of uh, an apple. It's like, ah is apple. Ah, ah, ah. Right? So they learn the sound ah. They learn to associate it with this picture apple. Right? And then on the same card, they have all the various letters that could possibly make that sound. Right? So when it comes to uh, ooh, you know, like it's in ooh, ooh, and, it's, and I'm, I'm showing, it's, like, it's a picture of a Rubik's Cube because it's ooh, ooh, twist the cube. Right? They want to get the ooh sound. And, and on that card, they have o, o. OU, and so they begin to associate letter combinations with picture combinations. And then what they do is once they've begun learning all these symbols and the sounds that are associated with it, they give them these little booklets, right, which are very simple stories. And over the top of all the words are these symbols. So that the kids, having known the symbols now, can sound out the words and begin to associate the sounds with what the words look like, and they, begin, they can begin reading very quickly. I, I was actually really amazed at how quickly my kids were able to pick up reading because of this system that they had developed. Now that's amazing, right? That's phenomenal. If we had an adult, though, who still required the little pictures over all the words, if we had an adult, though, who was struggling to read these sort of uh, read uh, simple words and all that sort of stuff. We would say, oh, 
that's, that you should have surpassed that by now. You should have moved on from that. You see, these, these pictures over the words, they were, they were a training ground. They, they, were, they were meant to serve you for a time to help you to learn how to read. But you should come to a point where you should be beyond that, where your abilities and your skills should be beyond that, and you should be able to read without any of these kind of aids and assistance. And this is what Paul is talking about when he's talking about how the law was used. It was a guardian. It was a custodian. It was there as a, an overseer over the people of God to, to help teach them, train them, keep them safe from transgression until such a time as they would actually receive the promise, as they would become uh, step into their inheritance. And part of the reason why Paul is so concerned for the Galatians, is it because he is seeing evidence that these Galatians are now stepping back into rudimentary things once again. This is what he says, this is what he says here in Galatians 4. He says, um, he says, but now since you've known God, or rather have become known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elements? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? You are observing special days, months, seasons, and years, and I am fearful for you that perhaps my labor with you has been wasted. Paul is concerned with the Galatians because, you see, already in, in, in Galatians, Paul has already talked to them. He's like, God, didn't you guys receive the Spirit? Did you guys not begin to experience salvation by faith? And have you experienced so much so far and it for, be for nothing? And he's talking about this experience. Paul has seen the Galatians grow in their faith with Jesus. He has seen the Spirit at work in their midst. He has seen them grow up into this faith. But now he's concerned because now what he is seeing is signs of regression. He's seeing signs of regression, just like we would, like we would say with children, right? If, if you have a child who's meeting developmental milestones, and then all of a sudden something happens, and they start regressing, and they, stop, and they, they, they regress on the developmental milestones, we would go, something is wrong. Something has happened. The children are supposed to grow up into maturity. They're not meant to move backwards in, down, down the milestone levels. And what Paul, is seeing, what Paul is seeing in the Galatians is a regression to former things, a regression to elementary things, a regression back into the ways and the forms of slavery. And that is a problem. That's a problem. Paul has concerns. And I would have the same concerns for you as well if, if, if I saw this happening in your life. We've all seen this. People who start out really well. People who start out really well. They, 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 come, they, 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 they come to know Jesus and it's even an exciting time for them. Everything is new. You see them come alive. You see them beginning to grow in faith. You see them beginning to mature. And then all of a sudden, maybe not even all of a sudden, maybe over time, things begin to change and they begin to regress and they begin to Go hard. We, we, we call it backsliding. That's the kind of the cultural phrase we use. You're sliding backwards into the old way of life that you had. Where your love for Jesus maybe has grown a little bit cold. Your love for others has grown a bit cold. Maybe you start going back and living in a pattern and a lifestyle that Jesus has previously led you out of. All of a sudden you find yourself like a dog returning to your vomit, going back to those previous sins which the Lord had freed you from. That pattern and that way of thinking, that way of living that God had led you out of. You find yourself going back to those things. If I, as a pastor, saw that happening in your life, we would say there's something wrong here. There's something going on here. And there would be a concern for what is going on in your life. Perhaps it used to be gracious. Perhaps it used to be about love. After all, Jesus said, you will be known by the love. You, they will know you as my disciples, as people who are trained and patterned after me by the love that you have for one another. It used to be about love, and all of a sudden it starts becoming very religious, not only with themselves, but with others. And Paul is worried. Paul is worried about the Galatians, just as I would be worried about you. If I begin to see these things happening in your life. He's, he's worried. Not because the things that they're doing are necessarily bad. All right, He says that they're observing days, months, seasons, years. All these sorts of things. Right, We do the same thing. Right, It's not a sin for you to celebrate your birthday. Okay? 
You're not, you're not living in sin. It's not a sin for you to celebrate Christmas. All right? We honor special days. We honor special seasons. We continue that tradition. Even, even You don't even have to be a Christian to do that. Right? Culturally in the West, we observe Christmas. But, but if all of a sudden it became about observing Christmas as the way it was the cultural marker that you were a Christian is that you observe Christmas. Well, that might be a problem. And what Paul is seeing is these signs. He's seeing this evidence that perhaps not all is well with the Galatians, that the teaching of the Judaizers has not benefited them, but it's actually caused a regression in their relationship with God to former things and former ways. And Paul is worried that they're going to get enslaved all over again. So Paul here, at the end of the passage that we talked about, um, he says he's worried. And he says he himself is now once again in labor pains for them that see Christ formed in them. Because he's so desperate that they would not sell themselves back into slavery once again, having once been liberated by Jesus. That's the broad brush strokes of what's happening in this passage. And I wanted us to make some progress here today. But what I really want to hone in on and emphasize here this morning is this story that Paul sees God's people as being a part of. A story that, a story that that's not only were the Galatians a part of, but the Jews in the first century, they were a part of it. But also we, we are actually a part of of this story as well. We are a part of this narrative, this thing that is going on that God is doing in Jesus Christ, even today, even in our midst. And what it is is that God is a God who actually takes slaves and he turns them into sons and daughters. Is he takes slaves and he turns them into sons and daughters. So even though Paul is writing this nearly 2,000 years ago, we are living in this same story of redemption. The story as Paul would tell it, and I, look, I'm going to be paraphrasing. I'm going to be taking some poetic license here, right? Because it's important that we don't just get bogged down in the technicalities of theology, but we understand the story that we're a part of. So the story as Paul might tell it, the story as Paul would tell it here, is that, is that there was a time in history where the human race, where we were born as slaves. We were born as slaves under the power of sin, and we were born as slaves under the religious order enforced by the principalities and powers in the heavenly realm. That was the reality for creation. That was the reality that first century Jews were born under. That was the reality that first century Gentiles were born under. No matter where you were in the world, there's this reality that there had come a slavery under the power of sin, a slavery under the kingdom of darkness. And that was the reality. And that was, that was I don't want to say acceptable, that was tolerated for a time by God. But that time would always come to an end. God always wanted better for mankind. After all, He created us to be His image bearers in the earth. And He had promised all the way back in Genesis 3 that one day He would come. That one day there would be the offspring of Eve that would come and crush the head of the serpent and bring salvation for all. And so this is the story, this is the narrative that that, that they were living under. This is the, the status quo they were living under. And then Paul says that, and at the right time, at the right time, God sent his own son, born of a woman and born underneath the law. God himself comes in the form of a man and and he actually offers himself born underneath that same tyranny, born underneath that same law, born underneath that same uh, slavery and condition. At the right time, he sends his own son into our world as a holy invasion force. And in his earthly ministry, he made war against all the powers of darkness and the way that they had enslaved. He says, Paul, uh, Peter would say in Acts uh, chapter 10 when he's talking to Cornelius and he's testifying about what God had done in the person of Jesus Christ. He would say this. He would say, he, being Jesus, went around doing good. He went around doing good and healing all those who had been under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. Every act of healing, every act of deliverance from unclean spirits, all of it was an act of warfare against the kingdom of darkness. And that at the crux, at at the climax of Jesus' earthly ministry, he goes to the cross. 
It goes, he goes to the cross. Now, we are in the inheritors of 2,000 years of church tradition. And so we automatically see the cross as a symbol of hope. We see it as a symbol of salvation. But you've got to remember, in the first century, the cross was not that. It was, a, it was a symbol of execution. It was a symbol of shame and torture. People would make fun of Christians because they believed in a Savior who had died on a cross. That was a point of shame. That was a point against the Christian religion, that the cross was involved. Because it was only the most shameful ones who got executed in that form and in that manner. It was the only the shameful. It was the only ones who had been cut off. And yet Jesus, in, in, in this moment where he is offered up on the cross, he has his moment of greatest victory. What looked like defeat to us was actually his moment of greatest victory. You'll, maybe you recall Jesus' words before the Sanhedrin when they're questioning him. They've arrested Jesus in the garden. They've brought him into, the, into, their, um, into their meeting and they're, they're questioning him. They're trying to find reasons to charge him. Are you the Messiah? Are you the Messiah? And he says, I am. And they rip their clothes and they say, blasphemy, what more testimony do we need? We've heard it here ourselves. He is claiming to be God. He has committed blasphemy here in this space. And what does Jesus say to them? Jesus says this. He says, from now, from now, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. Hearkening back to the vision of Daniel, that there would come one like a Son of Man, on the clouds, and he would reign, and he would rule, and he would conquer. That he would liberate. And then in the story, what happens is Jesus goes from the Sanhedrin, and they place a crown on his head, and they place a robe on his shoulders. Now they're mocking him, but you've got to understand, this is his enthronement. This is his coronation as king. They meant it to mock him. They meant it to shame him. But Matthew wants you to know and understand that this was actually his moment of glory. When Jesus is in the garden, he says to the Father, glorify me. Glorify me like in the glory I had before. This is the moment where he is being glorified, where he is coronated with the crown and the robe. And he goes up to the cross where he offers his life on a tree. And three days later, he rises from the dead. And in rising from the dead, he won a great victory over the power of sin and over the power of death itself. To which we say, amen. Because, because of Jesus, we have been freed. We have been freed from the power of sin. We have been freed from the power of death. We have been freed from the principalities and powers who would enslave us and send us to our own destruction by their ways that they have taught us how to live. We have been freed from all of that. And we say hallelujah and we thank the Lord for this great victory that he has won on our behalf. But the story doesn't end there. If it did, that would still be good news in and of itself. That would be good news in and of itself. That would be cause for great celebration in all the earth if that is all that he had done. During, in World War II, when the Allied forces liberated, occupied France from, Nazi, from, the, from the Nazis, the French people came out in the streets. They came out in the streets and were celebrating celebrating because their captors had been kicked out, their captors had been thrown out, and they were now free once again, and they celebrated, and they honored the Allied forces for what they had done on their behalf. We should celebrate the freedom that we have been given in Jesus Christ through that victory that he has won on the cross on our behalf. But it's more than that. Not only have we been freed from the powers of sin and death, but he goes a step further. He invites us to become part of his family and to receive the status as a son or a daughter with all the privilege that comes with it. It has been my experience that people get the forgiveness of sin bit, like, okay, like as in, who hasn't dealt with shame and guilt in their lives? You know, maybe if you're a sociopath or something, right? You've never dealt with shame or guilt in your life. But that's because there's something wrong in your brain. 
right? But for most people, you've dealt in some way with shame and guilt, even if that means the way you've dealt with it is you've hardened your heart so you don't have to feel it anymore. We get the whole thing about forgiveness, right? Because there's something in us that intrinsically knows when we feel that guilt, when we feel that shame, that there's, there's something wrong that needs to be resolved. We, people in the church, they get that. It's very simple for most people to understand. They get the whole salvation, you know, you get your ticket, you get to go to heaven at the end, right? That's pretty simple for people to understand for the most part. But one of the things I have seen people struggle and wrestle with the most, and, and, and I say I put my hand up for this as well, is the idea that in Jesus we have actually been given a status as sons and daughters of God. And that that means something. That actually means something. That's not just a nice thing that we say. Oh, you know, he gave us the right to become the son of God. And you, hey, you know, that's great. No, it actually means something about how you relate to God and how you relate to other people as well. He invites us to become part of his family. And it's hard for us to accept because we have lived our whole lives under a slave mindset where my value and my worth is based upon what I can do. This is why the Judaizers' arguments so easily persuade, right? This is why religiosity, even today, is, it's so tempting, right? Because it's just the same thing. It's the same thing that we've always experienced in this world, just repackaged with a religious veneer, Right? That my value and my worth as a human being is based not upon who I am, but what I can do. My value to society is based upon my productive output. My acceptance in society is, is dependent upon my ability to be valuable enough for people to love me. And so that's the way that it is out there in the world. And even in the church, we do the same thing. Whether we like it or not, we... Like I said, there's a reason why, there's a reason why people on the outside have trouble with church being religious and judgy. It's because we can get religious and judgy. Because we take that same thing and we bring it into the church, we put a religious veneer on it. Where your value to us as a community is based on what you can do for us. Where your acceptance in our midst is based on what you can do for us. Are you valuable enough for me to give you my friendship? Are you valuable enough for me to show love to you? Can I see that, that maybe you're a good relationship to have because that will bring me some kind of status? There's some benefit to actually knowing you and loving you. We, we do that in the church all the time. Now, thankfully, God is gracious. Thankfully, God is gracious. But that, that is the old way that is passing away. That's the old system that is going away. There is a new creation and this new identity we have been given as sons and daughters, this new revelation of sons and daughters. Jesus offers us the love of the Father for free, without earning, without striving. That's a really hard thing for us to grasp. It's a really hard thing for us to grasp. I know, I, look, I know personally in my own walk with the Lord, um, it's still something I'm learning to grow into. You know, that my relationship with the Lord is not performance based. His willingness to be with me and to love me is not based on the amount of hours I've clocked up in prayer. It's not based on how many verses from this thing I can quote. It's not how many people I've quote unquote evangelized this week. So often as Christians, we have these little lies that we believe that really just end up being tyranny and slavery to us. That somehow my acceptance before God is based on maybe 
how pure my mind has been this week or how well I've loved this week. You know, I've had a really good run at it this week, so now on Sunday I'm expecting God's presence because I've had a good run this week. When in reality, that's just the old slave mindset that's gotten repackaged. And God wants to break you out of that. He wants you to know and to understand that you are a son or you are a daughter of God based not on your ability to earn that position, but because he's freely given it to you in Jesus Christ. He's freely given it to you. And not out of pity either. He's given it to you because he loves you, that he loves you, that he loves you. And when we begin to embrace that revelation and allow that revelation to begin to work its way down into our hearts, it actually begins to change not only how we relate to God, but it begins to change how we relate to each other as well. You can observe and, 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 and see when people begin operating out of an orphan spirit. You can see it. It becomes about competition. About who, who, can, who, can, get, who can get, you know, time on the mic. Who can get honored from the front. Who can be seen as the big deal. It becomes competitive. And competition then breeds Envy. Begins breeding jealousy, which leads to anger and resentment. Sometimes we seek to control people, right? We we seek to con- you know we 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 can't can't handle other people just being free to do whatever they want, you know, in the Lord. That the Lord's not capable of having His servants do what His servants are going to do. It sometimes manifests as control. But it becomes about competition and scarcity. If the Lord is blessing my brother, well then maybe there's not enough for me. The reality is, is that in God's economy, all of it belongs to those who are heirs. All of it belongs to those who are heirs. And Paul would say this to you. He says, He came to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. It feels totally unfair, doesn't it? When you see God blessing somebody else and not necessarily blessing you in the way that you think that you should be blessed. You know, it's like, it's like, imagine you're working for... um, corporate, like a large business, right? And, um, and you're working in the department, I don't know, maybe you're doing admin, maybe you're doing sales or whatever, right? And you get this coworker, right? They got the same job as you. The difference is, is their daddy owns the company. Their daddy owns the company, right? And so even though you're equal, you know, maybe you're getting the same paycheck, maybe you got the same title, right? You know one day, when daddy dies, they get the company and they're going to be your boss, right? And there's something in us that goes, well, that's just not fair. That's just not, it doesn't matter how hard I work, it doesn't matter how hard I strive in this business, I know one day this, this guy or this girl, they're going to get the whole lot based nothing on how hard they've worked, but based on the relationship that they have with the owner of the company. This is, this is what, this is what um, Paul is saying. when he, This is the analogy he's giving. He says, when I say that, um, he says, so long as an heir is a child, he differs in no way from the slave. We can both be employees in the same company. Equal footing, right? When you're, when you're a child and you, and you haven't received your inheritance yet, you can be on the same footing. But once that inheritance comes, all things get handed over to that son or get handed to that daughter. Now, the beautiful thing about Jesus, the beautiful thing about what God is doing in turning slaves into sons is is when that son gets promoted, because remember, he sent his son to work in sales (laughs) and to offer his life in that department, to come as a servant here in our world, to, to, to walk alongside us, born under the law, 
Philippians 2 would say is because he went to the lowest place that he was exalted as the name of every name, King of kings and Lord of lords. The thing is, like when your co-worker gets exalted now because they are a son of God, the owner of that company also turns around to you and says, do you want to come too? I want to give you ownership over this as well. I want to give you the inheritance as well. I want you to become part of a partaker in everything that I have given to my son. I want you to become a partaker of it too. And the thing is, the way that that's going to happen, you can have it all for free. I just want you to become my son or become my daughter. I want to welcome you into my family. And you might be sitting there going, but, you know, I'm not qualified. I don't have the right degree for that. I may not have the experience necessary to run a company of this size or anything like that. He says, it doesn't matter. It's not based on what you could do. I'll help, I'll help you with everything that you need to do or get done or anything like that. What I want is the relationship, and I want you to come to be a son or a daughter. I want you to come and be part of my family, and you can participate, and you can have this inheritance as well. And that's what God wants for us. He wants us to stop thinking like slaves. He wants us to stop thinking that our acceptance was based upon our own ability to to work hard, our own ability to earn, our own ability to achieve. He wants to give you a new identity, a new status as a son or daughter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite the worship team to come back. I would love if we could stand, if you're able. I also want to invite the prayer team forward. And what we're going to do is, um, is I just want to pray for some people. Because I recognize that in a room like this, a lot of people, I'm, I'm going out on a limb here and saying there's probably more than one of you that is struggling to live from the revelation that you are unequivocally loved by God, that you are embraced by Him into His family. No matter what you have done, no matter who you are, and I want to pray for you to receive that revelation here this morning, that you are a son, that you are a daughter because of Jesus Christ, that you can live free, not only from sin, but you can live free from that anxiety that you're never going to be enough, that you can live from that place of peace knowing that your Father in Heaven accepts you, your Father in Heaven will provide for you, your Father in Heaven wants to give you the world alongside, be a co-heir with Jesus Christ. And so, um, so I'm going to get the worship team to pray. If you need prayer for that, I want to pray for you. If you need prayer for anything else, if you need prayer for anything else at all, I want you to come forward and receive prayer from the prayer team. If you just want to hang back and spend some time with the Lord, feel free to do that. All right, the, the service is officially, um, or at least this part of what we do as a church family is, is, is concluded. Um, there's tea, there's coffee, there's morning tea if you want to stick around. If you're new especially, um, we would love to get to know you. And the best place for that to happen is not in here. It's actually in the cafe. Uh, if you're in here, people are probably going to assume that you're spending time with the Lord and they're not going to disturb you. Right? So I just ask that you would just go into the cafe, stand around looking awkwardly, and I'm trusting that some of our people are going to come up and say hello. Um, but if you do have to head off, please go in the blessing and the favor of the Lord and, um, and ask the Holy Spirit to give you that revelation. Give you that revelation of your acceptance before God, that revelation of sonship, the revelation of the Father's heart. Because he longs for you to know him in that way. So Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. It's so undeserved and yet we are so thankful. Holy Spirit, help us to lay aside our own egos, our own pride. Help us to simply humbly accept your free offer of grace.